Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. We're talking about the stress recovery adaptation cycle. We revisited that. Right. And we were talking about how the stress has to increase, but we have a ongoing problem with recovering. As the stress goes up, the problem with recovery becomes harder to deal with or can become harder to deal with. And I'm trying to come up with a way to think about the components of programming, the tools that we have when we do programming that can help us deal with those challenges. So when we're dealing with this challenge of recovering from the stress, which we need more and more and more of over time, when we program, there's some stuff we can do, right? We can add weight to the bar. We can take weight off of the bar. We can increase frequency. We can decrease frequency. We can increase the number of sets. We can increase the number of reps. We can decrease all of those things. There are really only about four things that we can do. And then there's a fifth one maybe, which would be exercise selection. But there are really only four or five things that we can do. And then each of those has a positive or a negative, right? Add weight to the bar, take weight off the bar. Right? So we can manipulate intensity. Yep. Up or down. Up or down. Right? To increase stress or decrease stress. And we can manipulate volume up or down to increase stress or decrease stress. One of the things I want to talk about, maybe to have a completely separate podcast episode on is that I believe that frequency is clearly a function of volume. It's one of the ways we manipulate volume, right? It is a manipulator of volume. Mm -hmm. Yes. Increase frequency, decrease, right? You can increase volume by increasing frequency. You can also decrease volume by decreasing frequency. Just like we go from a three day squats, three days a week to a four day split increases the frequency of number of workouts per week, but decreases the frequency and thus the volume of the squat itself. So is recovery then actually an aspect of volume, right? Like you can't like actively, despite what CrossFit says, you can't actively recover. It's only like the absence of work, right? Yeah. So, right. So you can't program recovery is what I'm saying. The only thing that's actually recovery is food and sleep. Right. The rest of it is actually managing fatigue, right? So I don't like to think about, it's not wrong, but it doesn't work quite as clean in my head to think about manipulating training variables for either stress or recovery. I think what we're doing is we're manipulating training variables to increase the stress and potentially increase the fatigue. So do you think that increasing fatigue then is like, it's a good thing to do from time to time? If the stress isn't great enough to cause an adaptation, if there is no fatigue, then the stress wasn't great enough to cause an adaptation, right? Well, in LP, there's clearly fatigue. You squat in your last two or three weeks, you squat, you're just, you rack the bar, you take the plates off, you put the plates away, yeah, and you're beat, man. You sure. Know? And then you rest, and then you come back, and the fatigue's mostly gone. It's 92% gone, and you're able to do it again. Sure. Wouldn't that be the ideal situation if we could undergo the stress, endure the fatigue, have that dissipate, and then move on with your life forever? <laughs> uh, wouldn't that be the ideal situation? It would, except for the only way to do that, we've talked about this before, is that you could theoretically, you get to the point where in LP, as we talked about before, you work out, you do on Monday, you come back on Wednesday, and you're probably pretty much completely recovered on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And then pretty much completely recovered on Friday. But four weeks in and six weeks in and eight weeks in, there's obviously still some fatigue left over from the workout you had two days before. And when you get to the end of LP, there's tons of fatigue, right? right? You're still very fatigued from it. So at that point, theoretically, you could just keep spreading out your workouts. We've talked about this before. Instead of training every 48 to 72 hours, you could go to every 72 to 96 hours. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then you could train once every five days and you could train once every six days and once every seven. And if it was just an issue of stress and then recover and adapt and it was clean, then you could just keep doing that forever. You could just have a really giant dose of stress one day, rest for two weeks, come back and have a bigger dose of stress two weeks later and or show that you made progress. But we know that doesn't actually happen. And so that's why I think that stress recovery adaptation, as I said in the previous programming podcast, is not wrong Special recovery adaptation is a simple way of looking at things, and it's generally correct. But because we have to 
expose the body to multiple bouts of stress in order to make progress long-term, then this simple idea of we stress and then we recover and then we adapt is just too simple for Mm -hmm. intermediate and advanced programming. Collectively, it's still right. I mean, you still have this period, especially if you're preparing for, say, a powerlifting meet where all of that stress leading up to a powerlifting meet was the stress, was this overload. And then you get to sort of this peaking period that lasts two, three weeks before the meet where you, you try to dissipate the vast majority of fatigue without detraining, right? So you still kind of practice the lifts and you stay generally heavy, but you do very low volume and you let the fatigue completely mm-hmm. dissipate, but all of that strength remains. And then you go perform on the platform. That's what you're doing. But ultimately, I think that all of this stuff is really fatigue is one of the things that occurs. That's why I think I mentioned this last time that the fitness fatigue model is probably closer. It's at least a slightly more complicated view of stress recovery adaptation, but that a bout of stress that occurs, like when we train in the gym, leaves us with sort of two outcomes. We get both an increase in the adaptive response, the, for us, strength, we get stronger, but we also get more fatigued. And those things are constantly at war with each other. And if the fatigue goes up too much, then even though the stress was enough to drive a strength adaptation, we can't actually perform that strength adaptation. We can't show that that performance is there because there's too much fatigue left behind. And so we're constantly trying to manage an intermediate and advanced programming. We're managing both the stress and the amount of fatigue. And that amount of fatigue that we're managing, the way we do that is with recovery. So the recovery is the word that we use, but it's really this combination of sleep and food for recovery and periods of reduced stress in order to allow fatigue to dissipate. When we have too much fatigue, that's the overreach that we don't want, right? Well, I don't, actually, I think that sometimes you do want it. I think that an overreach state is okay. You can just get to the point where if you overreach for too long, then you actually get weaker, right? Right. And that's when you get into kind of overtraining, right? Now, I do think that it's tough to overtrain. I I certainly think it's possible. Very few people are going to do that, I think. Yeah, for older guys, they can do it, you know, but it's weird. I think that often overtraining for older populations is probably occurs more, at least at a sort of a physiological and acute level in things like joints than things like muscles, right? Like they just get so beat up and their joints, like their knees and their hips and their elbows and their shoulder, those are the things that hurt. It's not that their muscles are truly overtrained. Yeah, my shoulders quit before the rest of me does. Right. Yeah, and uh, so parts of, <laughs> parts of me overtrain. So do you program then for late intermediate or early advanced? I know you wouldn't say this. For, well, I think that you wouldn't say this for an early intermediate. Do you actually program to put that person at a certain level of fatigue? Are you seeking that? You are seeking that. Of course, I'm trying to drive up fatigue. That's what a loading period is, right? It's loading and deloading. Now for early intermediate, you know, late novice, early intermediate, I I would never plan for that necessarily. That's not something I'm planning for. But for an advanced lifter, like, sure, we're trying to plan for periods of loading. And then we actually have periods of deloading. Now, what I've changed about in my... Hang on, let me stop there. So are you actually, we've been talking about heuristics, is talking about fatigue a way of talking about how you program? Or are you actually seeking that state? You know what I'm saying? Like, is, sure. is fatigue a measure of how much stress they've gotten? Or you actually dig it, <laughs> right? Like, you could sure. say, oh, okay, he's fatigued. His bar speed has slowed. His first rep of his set on the next training day shows that he has fatigue. You know, is that something that you're seeking, that fatigue? Or is it just something that you use as a measure to say, okay, the stress was enough? Yeah. Probably that. Yeah. Especially going into a meet for somebody that's competitive. When they're six weeks out, five weeks out, I want them fatigued. They're hating it. I actually want that, right? Because I know their body and I want them enough fatigue, but I don't want too much, but I want them enough fatigue that their body can recover and adapt during that peaking period. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, obviously if it's just an enormous amount of fatigue, we're looking for the problem with that is you could just fatigue the hell out of somebody. You could just, I mean, it's CrossFit would work. Mm -hmm. to make you do whatever. And so it's super fatiguing. But what we're really trying to do is because the, again, because of that specificity principle, because we know that it has to be heavy to get stronger. If the goal is to get stronger, we've got to keep getting heavier, but I can't just load them up as heavy as I can just fatigue them as much as possible and let them get stronger either. There's still, we know that there's sort of this incremental increase that has to occur 
over the stress in the stress for the period, right? So, and of course that we've talked about this in the past that that, that period for novice is a very small period, right? It's just two, three mm-hmm. days. And for an intermediate, it's longer. And for an advanced lifter, it's even longer than that. But what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to constantly manage that level of both stress to increase stress over the course of the overload period and moderate fatigue so that the fatigue is enough to drive the adaptation. It's enough to disrupt homeostasis to drive the adaptation without driving them into the ground. Right. But also if there's not enough fatigue, right. And you get this too. This is where I've changed in my programming on an actual practical level. I used to, you know, we talked about how we're not big fans of templates of you know, eight week, 10 week, 12 week templates for even advanced lifters, but that we would often still use those templates and try to kind of tweak them to the person. But the thing that we tried to bring to the table, especially at online coaching is that we still watch your videos every single day and break down your, your videos. And, you know, I've actually gotten completely away from the templates over the last six months. And part of it is because let me explain, because there's a caveat there. I know what block training looks like, right? And I know what DUP looks like. I know what it's supposed to look like. I know what it's supposed to feel like. I know what the bar speed is supposed to be. And the problem that you get when you lay out a program that's a percentage-based program, which all advanced program templates are, they have to be, right? Yeah. In order to work from one person to the next, it can't be pre-programmed with weights. It has to be programmed with percentages of one rep max. So there's several problems with that. But one is that thinking that you can operate and that the level of the stress event would be the same for the same percentage of press as it is for squat or deadlift is just not the same. That's right. not the case, right? Yeah, now, the deadlift is almost always a lower percentage than that's right. the others. Now, good programming templates account for that, and they'll often have you bench press and press with a higher percentage for even equal volume than you would on the lower body lifts. But still, the person, that I, my client that I'm looking at I would rather watch them on a week by week basis and program for them one week at a time. So if they're in, say, an accumulation phase or a transmutation phase and they're in that general realm and I'm programming Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday for them, and then I'm watching, I'm going, well, I know they can go up 10 more pounds on squat, but they can only go up five more pounds on deadlift. Deadlift Mm -hmm. is hard. And the fatigue is starting to get there in their back on the deadlift, right? Or vice versa or whatever. And so what you'll see is that people make progress and fatigue differently on different lifts. And when you take a template, you're sort of pre-gambling on how much fatigue is going to be there. That's why a lot of these templates I've written in sort of three weeks of loading and a one-week deload. I don't pre-plan deloads ever anymore. I just give them when needed. Right. When the person is just like, you know, Workout after workout, they go three, four, five workouts in a row, and they're just like an entire week, let's say, where they're just slow and they're struggling to hit their lifts. And then I know that fatigue is too high, and I've got to back off the fatigue. I've got to get fatigue to dissipate some. And so there's lots of ways to do that, although I actually think that we generally, at this point, most people agree in strength training, even people who would tend to disagree with us about how we program. I think most of us deload a similar way. Most of us stay pretty damn heavy and we just reduce the volume to reduce the amount of fatigue. And so the intensity may still come down two or three or 5%, but the volume is often cut sometimes in, in half, half. Yeah, I do in half. Uh, in order to, and of course that depends on the person. So that's just, you know, don't take that as a true standard, but that's what we do. So again, what I'm doing here is I think it's wrong to look at recovery as Ways that we can manipulate training variables. Aquinas says that evil is just, it's not an active thing. It's an absence of the good. Right. So your, your recovery is just the absence of the stress. Yeah, that's actually exactly right. Yeah. Recovery is the absence of the stress. Yeah, so you might think about recovery when you're doing programming. You're like, I better leave some space in here, but you're not programming recovery. It's just like you're not giving them a bolus, a dose of stress during that period. No, and although we do sometimes actually tell our clients what to do during the week, we're like, hey, listen, this is, you've got a lot of fatigue right now. We're going to give you a deload week next week. You it's really eat. important to get extra sleep. If you can't get eight hours of sleep at night, I want you to try to take a nap in the afternoon, try to get an extra hour of sleep in the afternoon if you need to, especially if they're a nutrition client. We talk to their nutrition coach and say, right. can we bump them up 500 calories, especially on protein and carbohydrates so that they got the ability to recover. A lot of people will go in a deload week and they're like, well, I'm not training very hard, so I'm going to back off my calories. And yeah. That's dumb. Yeah. Why would you back off your calories on a deload week? I know what they're thinking. They're thinking, well, it'll make me fat. I don't need that many calories. No, no, no. This is actually when you need it because you're stressed to the point that fatigue is built up. 
and you're not able to make progress because there's too much fatigue. So what we have to do is dissipate the fatigue. Well, how do we do that? Fajitas, man. That's how we do <laughs> fajitas. it. Fajitas. You know, the Tacos beautiful fajita. Chill. So knowing these things that we've just talked about, that maybe recovery isn't a thing, but it's the absence of the stress and that so everything that we do is related to stress. And then how can we manipulate that stress? And there are only a few things we can do. We yes, can do three. Some, we can, we can do something three. with the weight. We can do something with the frequency. We can do some. No. No? Yeah. Yes, but what would I call that? So we can do something well, with volume. intensity or we can do something with volume, well, which is frequency. Same. Well, okay. Stay with my thought I, process with for a second. And then what's the third one, which is a clearly a secondary which would be the exercise selection, I think. Exercise selection. That's basically it. Now, yeah. I actually said that primary training variables that we manipulate are intensity and volume, and secondary are frequency and exercise selection. But then I explained frequency is secondary because it's really just a function of volume, right? So I get it. I'm sort of arguing semantics, but what I like to do is try to make things as simple as I can first, and then we can kind of get in the weeds and what that looks like. Yeah, well, it's not semantics. Like we need to organize these principles so when somebody comes to programming, they can say, okay, there are three things I can do here intensity intensity volume and exercise volume selection. and exercise selection so let's take intensity three. let's take intensity first what can you okay. do with intensity which is easy right intensity is easy intensity is easy you put weight on the bar or you take weight off of the bar that's so, exactly right that's it those now, are the only two things you can do and then that one then in turn affects the second one which is the volume that's right so they play with each other outside of early in a program in an advanced program or during novice programming is the only time that intensity and volume do not have an inverse relationship. Right. They must have an inverse relationship. Well, now, let's be super rigid here. Okay. The relationship still stands. We just don't manipulate it. Correct. So in novice programming, we said this in the last podcast was in novice programming, frequency stays the same. Volume stays the same. That entire volume component is the same. Exercise selection doesn't change. The only thing that changes is intensity goes up. Right. So you know stress goes up because everything else is a constant and one variable increases. When That's we, it. And when we need to reduce stress to make room for recovery, we manipulate at the end of LP, we manipulate the intensity by lowering the midweek squat session. Correct. Bar, exactly. The weight on That's the bar. exactly what we do. We only manipulate intensity during novice linear progression. That's the only thing we manipulate. And at the end, you start getting to advanced novice and making the minimum effective dose changes into Texas method or heavy light medium, then when you start playing with other things. So, but intensity is simple. Yeah, there's not much more to say about that programming component. Sure. The volume next, is complicated. The next one is volume. What can we manipulate with volume? Sets. Sets. Reps. Reps. Frequency. Frequency. Those are all the things that can be manipulated. So let's talk about sets first. Okay. In LP, clearly it's three sets of five, unless it's the power clean, in which case it's five sets of three, or the deadlift, which is one set of five. Sure. When we do the minimum effective dose change, we will often drop one set. Or add one set. Or add one set. Often I'll do them in tandem. So we talk about the minimum effective dose. Sometimes the minimum effective dose is changing two things. So it might be, I'm going to add a set Monday, and I'm going to drop a set on Friday. And in doing so, because there's an inverse relationship between the volume and the intensity, I'm able to actually put some poundage on the bar on the Friday. We right. lose some volume that leaves room for an increase in the intensity because there's an inverse relationship. And there. you lose some intensity on Monday with the increase in volume. So then you start to see that the stressor on Monday is the volume. It's really tonnage and then is what I said last time. And then your Wednesday the is The stressor a on Friday is intensity. And then, right. yeah, Wednesday is what? And Wednesday is a little bit of a deload. And so what you end up with, you have a tiny block. You have a five-day block. Yeah, so Wednesday, we've talked about this before. We probably do an entire episode just on Wednesday and argue about what's really going on Wednesday. And again, <laughs> I think sure. it's probably smart to say we actually don't know. It's one of those yeah. things. We're not entirely. We think that, I know you talked about you drop it out some, which is fine too. I think what Wednesday is, is I don't consider it a recovery day. That's why I think the terminology is wrong there. People think about Texas method as being that Monday is the stress day, Wednesday is the recovery day, and Friday is the adaptation day, is the performance mm -hmm. day. I disagree. I think both that Monday and Friday are clear, heavy stressors. You bet. The volume is a heavy stressor, I the keep, way that volume stresses you. I keep giving this illustration. I'm going to do this again and again and again until people get it. If the Friday doesn't count, then you're stuck with strong lifts. 
Yeah. And you could just go Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, and Monday would always go up. Right. Until it couldn't. Friday doesn't count. If Friday is only a performance, then just take it out and just do your five by fives on Monday, every Monday and only on Mondays and do a light day on Wednesday. Well, that doesn't work. Like that's obviously Friday is enough of a stressor. So yeah, you can try that yourself in, in C and you can also look at, you know, other people's training logs and look at, you know, people's success or failures with the strong lifts protocol. And then you'll know that once the novice phase is over, you have to have uh, we have to have periodization. You have to have some changes in intensity and some changes in volume to drive the changes. Correct. I want to say something more about midweek. By the way, next time we have Sully on, we need to just we should talk about midweek because he's yeah he is firmly in the camp that nobody knows what, <laughs> knows what happens in midweek. For my older guys, I say I drop it out. For my older guys, I will often do that. For my underweight guys, by the way, you don't drop out your midweek. You just drop out the squat. I drop out the squat. That's right. And so keep the other stuff. That's right. Right. But for my underweight guys. I've got them squatting for eights because I'm trying to put some meat Let's on them. Let's start with what we do know about Wednesday. What do we know is going on on Wednesday? Well, we know that Wednesday is a day that is there to not increase fatigue. Right. So fatigue should not increase on Wednesday. There's clearly still fatigue left from Monday because Monday was hard and sucked, yeah. at least if once you've been in it for six weeks or so. Wednesday cannot make that fatigue number go up. So if you're left, you know, on a scale of one to 10, if you're left with a fatigue rating of six and a half, right? Just for purposes of argument, six and a half Reynolds, and you go in and you kill yourself on Wednesday and you crush it. Right. And now your fatigue is an eight. You can't go in Friday and squat a heavy set of five. So nope. Wednesday is there to help fatigue dissipate while still getting good work in. And of course the other stuff is important too. And so I think that Wednesday often helps avoid detraining. I think it's practice for Form, although again, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, form changes dramatically when you go from 60% to 70% to 80% to 90% to 99%. And so I've heard before that Wednesday is sort of a practice day for squat. And I would say, well, using your own definition of what practice is, don't know how much practice is actually going on there when the weight is as light as it is compared to your truly your five rep max or whatever. So let's go back to our principle. We know fatigue is going to be reduced. So you, you can do now. anything from what you're doing sets of eight with your young guys to nothing on squat with your older guys, anything in between, but your younger guys can probably handle sets of eight. It doesn't beat them up real bad at all. And, and they're not terribly heavy. Right. Um, so let's go back here. So we were talking about volume and the, the first thing we said that we can do is uh, change the number of sets. Correct. And the other thing we can do is change the number of reps. That's why you'll see, you know, in our discussion with Andy Baker from a few weeks ago, we were talking about moving guys to three triples on their Fridays, uh, and then later to a couple triples or maybe a single triple. So we can change the volume. We can drop the volume from five reps to triples. Again, to serve what purpose? To drive the if intensity. If you drop it up. Up from five to triples, it's to get the intensity to go up. That's right. Right. And you know, obviously, the sets and the reps are intimately connected as well because you can manipulate one or the other and the other one usually changes. So for example, like you can go to three sets of eight, like what you're doing for your younger guys on Wednesday, but I'll often go eight sets of three. Yeah, it's fine. I actually tend to like that better for the strength adaptation. And so those are all things that can be, so you can change the number of sets you perform to increase or decrease volume. You can increase or decrease the number of reps you perform to manipulate volume. But you can also increase the number of sets or the number of reps by increasing the number of bouts that you have per week or in a given time period mm -hmm. by increasing or decreasing frequency, right? So one of the things I can do if I need to get more volume in, then I can just add another session of that thing, right? Or maybe it's just another workout in general to increase the total systemic volume on the body. And so that's why frequency is almost always a function of volume. If I have somebody sort of later advanced sort of people in novice programming, they are pressing 1.5 times per week mm -hmm. and they're bench pressing 1.5 times per week. And by the time they are advanced, they are often doing both of those three times a week. Yeah. You know, those two movements can withstand the most bouts in a week especially by the way i think bench press can actually handle more than press in spite of like we know that there's a way to press that shouldn't beat your shoulders up but it does seem like the standing up with the weight in your hands and your shoulders and everything that's going on with especially kind of the rear delt and infraspinatus and whatnot you know you can beat up your shoulders if you're doing both and so the first thing i would do is drop one of those press movements but the frequency continues to go up and that's because 
by the time they're advanced, if they're pressing two or three times a week and they're bench pressing three times a week, I can't get that much volume in right. if they were only doing those things two times a week each yeah. or 1.5 times a week. Like you just couldn't do it. And yeah. so we often manipulate volume with those upper body lifts by just increasing the frequency. How many heavy reps can a person do of a pressing motion in a given workout? You know, 25 to 30 would be the most I would sure. ask of someone. So if you want more volume, where the heck are you going to get it? You're going to have to add a day. And we end up adding half of a day a week when we go to the four day split. And That's right. Then, and then later on, we'll even add another slot in a four day split. So a guy will press for either or, and then he'll do some bench press of some bench press variant. And then we'll have him press again. And he's going to do a pressing variant at this point. So we've added a slot in his four days. Oh, well, split. you do it on upper body day? I'll do it on upper body day. So I'll usually add it one of those to a lower body day. So I'll bench and press on the two upper body days. So I'll, I'll do both. So well, that gives you your four slots. And I'll add a fifth slot to one of the lower body days. So I'll squat and then I'll either press or bench press and I'll deadlift, so whatever what you, that variant is at that point. It depends on what you want to do. Like if he presses, competition press, three sets of fives, you know, something sure. vanilla. And then you having bench press, it probably something less vanilla. And then sure. you add another slot. I got him on the ropes. He's already fatigued. So now it doesn't take as much weight in that third pressing slot. So then I can use exercise selection because I got him on the ropes. He's already very fatigued. So a little extra work goes a long way. But if I have a guy that I want him to have lots of heavy in his hands, then I'll do what you're talking about. I'll put that extra press at the end of his squat and deadlift day because he can move something probably heavier that day for that extra sure. slot. Sure. So now we're at exercise selection. So we've talked about adding sets, reps, slots. We've talked about frequency. And now we're at the exercise selection. Yep. We can select exercise variants of our four main lifts to either put more weight in their hands or less weight in their hands. Yeah. And I think let's give the caveat too first that we know, and I, I think that there's almost nobody that would argue with this, that for strength, I'm sure there are some, but in general, nobody that's somebody listening, that's to this, nobody that's listening to this podcast would argue this, that for exercise variants to help drive a strength adaptation, especially a strength adaptation on the four main lifts, then those variants better look really similar to the four main lifts. Yeah. People talk about carry over. Does it carry over? If you want them to carry over to the four main lifts, they better look really similar to the four. They better be pretty specific to the four main lifts. So. Right. Something that is still a barbell, right? Dumbbells don't carry over very well. Really light doesn't carry over really well. Single leg, single arm doesn't carry over very well. Right? Those sorts of things. And so what we're trying to do is, just like you said, we're trying to choose a variant that either increases the weight we can handle and as a trade-off often has a reduced range of motion or decreases the weight we can handle but increases the range of motion, that's almost always like the mm -hmm. only exception with that is a tempo piece, which is usually the same range of motion, but done slower. Therefore, the stress goes up and because it's slower, there's more time under tension and therefore you use less weight. But with everything else outside of tempo, what we're doing is, is it's more weight, less range of motion, less weight, more range of motion. Yeah. A lifter seems to be able to do X amount of work in a given lift. And remember from our Junior high physics, work equals force times distance. So if we make D go down, F can go up. Or if F goes up, D has to come down. So right. we can talk about like the deadlift. On a deficit deadlift, you're going to pull the bar over a longer range of motion. D has gone up, so F almost has to go down. So the weight on the barbell has to go down. Then on the rack pull, you know, we can move that rack pull up to two inches above your knee, and you can maybe pull... 30% more than your one rep deadlift we are, you know. Sure. So when yeah, I pulled a thousand at an 18 inch deadlift, 18 inch deadlift is just below the kneecap. I pulled a thousand at a strongman, silver dollar deadlift, strongman meet. Now here's the, here's why lots of guys dropped out in the 800 range. And then I pulled a thousand at 800. The bar wouldn't bend enough to get just above the kneecap, mm -hmm. but at 900, the bar got just a little more flex and you could get your kneecaps under the bar and put right. yourself in a little better position. And then I was able to lock out a thousand in the same thing. Of course, it's strongman. So it's straps and hitching. And, you know, if you ever watch me lift, I've got a clean hitch. I've got like a pretty nice hitch. It's not like this weird, ugly monkey humping hitch or anything. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so that you're exactly right. So here's the question. First, why would we do a 
movement that reduces the range of motion but increases the intensity. Well, what are we trying to accomplish? Well, in that case, we may want to train that range of motion, right? We may want to increase their strength at lockout in the, in the example of the rack pull. We may want to do that. Yep. Or a board press or a slingshot or a or pin press. Any of those. Pin squat. You know, yep. But oftentimes I want to give them some more training stress, but not as much as they would get from pulling from the floor from the, uh, mm -hmm. from the uh, deficit deadlift. There are some people, though, I'll tell you, there are some people that the rack pull just devastates them. That's also why these templates don't work all the time. Right. You know, I, I often put a rack pull in to actually reduce stress. It's heavier yeah, weight, but reduce stress. For most people, I think a rack pull tends to be a lesser stress event than a full range deadlift. But every once in a while, you find somebody there, it's not. It's the opposite. Yeah, there's something about the time under tension it takes to get the thing to come off the pins. I think that right. tears up certain people. And I think they're a pretty small minority. It may be a minority of one, one Bob Tanner. No, it's not. <laughs> I mean, well, and here's the other thing. My other experience is talking about specifically a rack pull. When we talk about a rack pull, the first several weeks you do it, it's really hard on your body. More so than even most other novel exercises, by the way. There's an argument out there that the novelty of the exercise increases the stress and that helps you get stronger. And I would agree with the first two thirds of that statement. The novelty of the exercise does increase the stress, but novelty doesn't make you stronger. Just because it's novel doesn't mean it makes you stronger, right? Skateboarding wouldn't make me stronger. Yeah. What you'll find with most people when they rack pull is, especially if you set a rack pull where the kind of where most of us do it, which is like an inch below the tibial tuberosity, a little bump on your shin. You started about an inch below that. So the weights, you know, I don't know, three inches, three, four inches off the ground, somewhere in there. Just reducing the range of motion of a deadlift by three, four inches, right? Most people deadlift less the first two, three yes. weeks they deadlift. They can't rack pull as much as they deadlift. They do it and they're like, man, why is this so hard? It's a reduced range of motion. It's, well, because you're out in no man's land. There's no tightness there. You set up, you can't get tight. You're used to getting tight at the bottom of a deadlift. Yeah, we like to start. I think me and you both like to start. I learned it from you. Start our partials in no man's land. No man's land is that place where the lift slows down. You know, four or five inches off the bottom in the squat, you know, an inch and a half below the knee, right above your hairline in the press. You know, we like to start them in that place because we want to train that place yep. uh, as much as we can. So we talked about we can vary the intensity, we can vary the volume, and we can vary the exercise selection. Now, I want to go back to volume because we didn't carry that all the way out. We can add slots in the week, right? We talked about that. Sure. We can add you know, extra bouts, but we can also look at that volume for a longer time horizon, right? Weeks or even months sure. for these you know, advanced blocks of training. You have to. Again, I think tonnage is a better indicator. Here's why it's a better indicator. I'll give you a, a simple math example. All right. Which can you do more weight on three sets of eight or eight sets of three? Eight triples. Obviously. So it's exactly the same volume. Yeah. Right. It's 24, yeah. but it's a higher tonnage, which is why I think that that tonnage number matters. That tonnage number matters, right? Like it's a tonnage is a good quantifiable metric for volume. It's not the only thing that matters, right? I certainly wouldn't put it above PRs, although I do think a tonnage PR is kind of an interesting thing to keep. But I also think that at the point where the weight isn't heavy, we could all do German volume training, do 10 sets of 10 at 60%. And that's a tremendous amount of volume. Yeah, but we, did we that make a, us stronger? We need a coefficient to put on the tonnage that will also tell Correct. us something about, you know, how high the intensity was. Intensity. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So we need to take our tonnage and then maybe divide it out by the average load on the bar yep. for each of those. And then that would give us an integer that would tell us something about what was going on. The smaller the number, the better it would have been, actually. Yeah. yeah. That would be that would be an interesting way to do it. Yeah, that's yeah. I like that. Do like saber metrics for lifting. Right. <laughs> we'll like we'll create these new metrics where it actually we've you know, already we've already created the Reynolds, which is the fatigue unit, and then the Hambrick, which is the recovery unit. And then we need to put well, a you know, and I know you're not a sports fan and I'm not a sports fan anymore, but I used to be, but the movie Moneyball with you familiar with this movie? I Having, have heard I'm that sure it never seen it. There were some guys that came out there were the Oakland athletics years ago, early two thousands. They didn't have any money. They were a poor franchise and uh, they just became these sort of very, they really honed in on statistics 
And a very simple one in baseball that makes sense is that for years, batting average was where it was at. What is the guy's batting average? What's his batting average? And then they came out and said, well, wait a minute. On base percentage is actually far more important because you could walk, right? Mm. Some guys walk a lot. Well, a walk is exactly the same thing as a hit. Yep. That's what they said. They said, what is the difference if a guy walks, if the guy, there's four balls and he gets to walk to first base versus getting a hit and he has to run to first base? What's the end result? First base. Right. That's the end result. And so they said, well, that's a better metric, right? So I think what we're doing here is to say, look, there's clearly, there are limitations to using any of these single metrics outside of PRs. I think PR is the metric that like, if you're continuing to set PRs in different rep schemes, different set schemes, different whatever, I think that that's the main driving force. But as you start to look at these other things, the problem with volume alone doesn't take into account intensity. Right. Tonnage does take into account intensity, except that you can still play the game and keep driving the tonnage up and not have enough intensity to drive a strength adaptation. And what you're saying is there's probably a metric we could come up with that utilizes both tonnage over average intensity, right? Is that what you said? Somewhere in that ballpark to yeah. get a number that say like, okay, now we can actually see what kind of progress we're making. That's interesting. Yeah. Play with it. Yeah. I know we got a bunch of you stats nerds that listen to this. Let's figure that thing out and we'll plug it into some of the numbers that see what we come up with. Yeah, we need a, an intensity weighted uh, tonnage number that we use, I think, yeah. that, that would uh, tell us more. Because like, you know, I, I gave the example of my man, Tim, in the 36,000 pounds of tonnage for his press. And so, you know, trying to figure out what we would do next, it would be very useful for me to know what the average intensity was during that 36,000 pounds. It would, make, yes. it would let me make better programming decisions. The way it is yes. now, I'm going to have to actually go back and look at every program press workout that he did during that cycle, then iterate on that. And so an, the weighted thing would be better. So let's wrap it up. Yep. We believe, I believe, I'll speak for you. There are only these three things that we can do when we program. And those those three things give us a great deal of variability, you know, millions of options actually when we do the programming. But every decision that you make will boil down to manipulate one of those three things, the intensity, the volume, or the exercise selection. And to look at it any other way is, I think, too overcomplicated. It's complicated enough because of the number of potential options that are available. So uh, looking at it in those basic ways, I think, is the cleanest way to do it. You could sit down and look at the man's program and say, mm, um, we need to drive intensity this cycle. And then you know because there's an inverse relationship between it and the volume that the volume will have to come down. And then you can use variance uh, so you can drive the intensity up by reducing some of the volume. And then you can also use variance that allow you to put more weight in the guy's hands and by using partials and things like that. So sure. uh, you can look at the problem at hand, think about the three options that are available, and then use the variance inside those options to then get to the goal that you need for your trainee. That's a good general way of stating it, although I think it's also important to state the practical for the vast majority of people who are listening to this podcast. The goal is to get stronger. That's exactly right. So here's what we know. Regardless of what the goal is, as long as there is a goal, stress must be increased over time. Yes. We know that. Stress has to go up over time to keep making progress, whether your goal is to run a marathon or whether your goal is to squat 800 pounds, right? But if your goal is to squat 800 pounds or to just get stronger, then while intensity is a variable that can be manipulated, the end goal is that intensity always goes up. Always goes up. Like it has to, right? And again, I'm talking about intensity, not just in terms of percentage of one rep max, but actual one rep max or actual load on the bar, or actual magnitude, whatever you want, like the actual weight on the bar. If the goal is strength, that is what the strength is force production if for force production to go up, the weight must go up. Now, we do recognize, and hopefully we flesh this out decently today, and we'll do so in future episodes as well, that we can contribute to force production increases via manipulating volume and making volume right. go up. So certainly that is an important variable to use. But ultimately, ultimately, intensity has to go up if the goal is strength. And ultimately, stress must go up over time in order to keep driving that adaptation has to that was an interesting conversation for me i hope other people enjoyed it yeah, too. me too thank you so much for listening this again the barbell logic podcast and we will talk to you guys in just a couple of days thanks 